Kundin, um, uh, welcome to the show. You are a queer indigenous Buddhist, Hindu, and Sikh activist, born and raised in Myanmar, and your work revolves around educating people on cultural appropriation and col uh, colonialism. And what I truly mm -hmm. admire about your work is that you help creatives and artists uh, better understand their aspirations, their desires, and you do this with a full awareness and recognition that xenophobia and colonization are real forces that impact artists and creatives of color. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest culprits of colonization within this space is toxic positivity. Mm -hmm. uh, so my first question is, how is toxic positivity uh, related to colonization? And what is your suggestion for alternative ways of you know, providing that level of positivity or motivation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up. And the reason, you know, why I do it from that framework is certain things that are taught in Western uh, coaching industry, personal development industry, personal growth industry, the spiritual healing industry, et cetera, right? Which is basically the industry that I am in, right? It's often taught from a lens of what works for white people, especially uh, cis white men, right? And evil bodied as well, right? And so, for example, things like uh, even something seemingly innocuous such as consistency, right? Hmm. Uh, there are some people who are with a different form of neuro uh, neurodivergence, for example, or people who are disabled, uh, et cetera, who work differently, we can't always be consistent, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are certain contexts where uh, consistency and the push towards that can be ableist because not everyone can afford to be consistent. And the other thing that's often taught is uh, one of the solution for specifically for writer's block, but even creative blocks in general. You know, I've heard, for example, Seth Godin say, you know, oh yeah, just sit there and write, like keep writing, you know, and then mm -hmm. things will emerge, right? Mm -hmm. and, and basically recommending uh, playing a numbers game where 99 out of knowing that 99 out of 100 things you create will probably suck and one out of 100 will succeed. And there is a, a pro and con to that, right? There are part of the pro is, you know, luckily, you know, most people will not remember what we created that was bad. We all, most people only remember what was great about our creations, mm -hmm. which is kind of a relief, right? But the con side of a recommendation like that is how much white people and people who have what I would call, uh, which we'll get more into later, this onto epistemological privilege in general, who are at the very top, they are given more, uh, put more on a pedestal, right? So even something they create that's just slightly above average is considered great. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for them to play that numbers game. There is a very famous uh, statement, I believe, in the TV series Scandal when the, the black father told her, his black daughter, you know, you have to work four times as hard to make half as much as them or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's literally true, in my opinion. And it's, you know, it's, of course, most true for the most oppressed, such as, you know, black and indigenous people. But I think it's even true for brown people as well. So that's like another example of how and how toxic positivity plays into that is, you know, all of you just work hard, right? You will succeed, right? Mm -hmm. And and there are different versions of that, right? There is a book that came out a few years ago called Deep Work by Cal Newport. So his version of that is like the next step, oh, if you work deep enough, right? Mm -hmm. Which is another version of saying if you work smart enough, right? So it's either work hard or smart or deep enough, right? Mm -hmm. And and then the new age or the spiritual version, the colonial spiritual version is, oh, if you just, you know, think positive in addition to working hard, 
then you will succeed, right? Mm. So it doesn't take into account the fact that there are that certain people uh, to give the the jogging or the running analogy, certain people are already uh, halfway ahead of the line, right? And they have no obstacles in front of them, whereas other people are not only behind, but they have all of these obstacles in front of them. So that's why toxic positivity is dangerous. Hmm. You know, it, in, in in speaking of that discussion of, um, mm -hmm. you know, artists and this concept of having to work four times as hard to get half the results, um, I think this really segues into this discussion that um, I wanted to have about cultural appropriation because mm -hmm. I think for a lot of folks, issues related to cultural appropriation oftentimes are brushed off as being, oh, it's just this minor issue because, you know, the focus then becomes on the person who was um, appropriating. That is the person mm -hmm. who then the, the entire conversation becomes uh, revolved around like, oh, who got canceled? Mm -hmm. Who is being cringy? Um, and oftentimes it feels like this focus on the embarrassing or this cringy person um, overshadows the main discussion about the real appropriation of people, of communities, of cultures. And so I want to know, mm -hmm. like, uh, why is this you know, cultural appropri appropriation, why is this a significant subject for you? And what do you wish more people understood about the depth of uh, cultural appropriation? Mm -hmm. What you just brought up in my experience is part of a, a larger conversation called uh, reverse victimhood, right? And in my opinion, it's misleadingly called fragility or white fragility or uh, straight fragility, male fragility, etc. right? And, and by the way, fragility was, that term was invented by a white woman. And when she wrote the book, White Fragility, and she's way profiting from anti-racism work, which she shouldn't be as a white person, which is a whole other conversation we could get into later. But I don't like the term fragility because it actually reinforces the idea that they're victims when they're not, right? Mm. That they're fragile. They're, they're not actually fragile. They are using literally a psychological weapon called reverse victimhood. And, and I'm no psychologist, so I don't want to get too much into that side, but reverse victimhood, interestingly enough, it is part of a larger thing called DAVO, which is what narcissists use. DAVO is an acronym for uh, Defend, Attack, Reverse Victimhood Offense, right? Mm where the, the oppressor or the abuser or the bully would turn the tables around, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where we get the term white tears as well, right? Mm -hmm. They might even start crying, right? And then they would claim they're the victims and then they would accuse the people they just victimized as bullies and that is reverse victimhood, right? Mm. In my studies, they have used this weapon on both the, la the larger macro scale and the micro scale, such as the white tears, for centuries. Like a big example is uh, the British uh, centuries ago, I don't know how long ago, but they, when they were having a, a battle with Kali worshiping tribes in India, mm -hmm. and I'm Indian, I'm South Asian, I'm Punjabis, and they may or may not be my ancestors. They might have been. And they, so the, the Kali worshiping tribes were defending back their land because the British were attacking them. Mm -hmm. So they, the British in response, they did a narrative warfare first, right? They decided to call the Kali worshiping tribes thugs. Mm. And then they criminal, criminalized all of them as thugs. And then they killed, in the basically a genocide, 10 million people, including newborn babies. So I see reverse victimhood as, you know, something in the, with a long legacy of genocide and colonialism happening. Now, within the context of cultural appropriation, what that is, is that the conversation is often uh, turned upside down in reverse victimhood style, it's, it's turned into, oh, like, 
why can't I as a white person, for example, if I'm white, mm -hmm. or why can I, you know, do what I want and have this freedom of expression, or why can't I follow the religion that I want? Why are you being such a fascist or extremist? Which, by the way, is a modern version of calling us thugs or savages. And that is the wrong, that's the, the upside down thing that I'm talking, the reverse thing, because the real conversation is why can't the people of the actual culture practice their culture in peace, mm -hmm. right? Why can't black women let their hair grow naturally on top of their heads? Mm -hmm. Why is it that in California, they had to make a law called the Crown Act so that employers don't discriminate to let them let their hair grow, right? Mm -hmm. Why was the Hawaiian language illegal until the late 80s, right? Or even the example that you gave, right, about traditional Chinese pra uh, medicine practitioners being arrested, right? Mm -hmm. Just for practicing their culture, right? So that is the real conversation. Meanwhile, we have white people openly saying aloha, right? Even back in the 80s when it was still illegal, but even now as well, right? Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, there are white corporations that a few years ago started suing, ironically, traditional mom, mom and pop Hawaiian shops for using their own Hawaiian word, poke. I don't know oh, how to yeah, I remember it, the story. Right? <laughs> yeah. Can you, do you notice the irony of that, right? That's again, reverse victimhood. So they've totally flipped the conversation into their freedom of expression rather than our freedom to just live our lives. That is why this whole, that is why I fight so much about it because it is actually within this larger context of, it's not about telling people what to do or what not to do because we don't even have the systemic power to stop them, right? Mm -hmm. It's about it's about reclaiming our rights to practice our culture. That is the real conversation here. Yeah, and and I'm glad that you put a name to it about this idea of um, reverse victimization because that really does mm -hmm. explain a lot of these. You know, it's it's like those Karen videos of people who mm -hmm. get caught being racist abusing people but then once they find out that they're on camera it then becomes about their white tears it becomes about the fact that oh my gosh you're embarrassing me uh, my life is going to be ruined and yet they're out here ruining other people's lives and so i think mm -hmm. this you know goes into um you know our ability to dive into the conversation about uh, colonization specifically uh, mm -hmm. because for many activists digging into the history of colonization can reveal so many different things about you know why mm -hmm. things are the way that they are why we feel the way that we feel about ourselves and why systems and ideas exist in society in the first place uh, mm -hmm. and so one of the specific types of colonization that you actually uh, brought up earlier and that you talk about on your platform is colonial spirituality and this is something that I actually mm -hmm. haven't really engaged with all that much so what is colonial spirituality um, what does yeah. it look like and, and how does it manifest in our day to day? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I originally called it whitewash spirituality, but I renamed it as colonial because mainly because there are uh, even some POC themselves who also, uh, for whatever reason, you know, have taken on colonial spirituality. Uh, in some cases, it's because they've been like, uprooted from their own culture and disconnected. Even I, at one time, was very much into, you know, believing in some of these beliefs, right? So, so that's why I renamed it as colonial because it's also more accurate because uh, going back into uh, what I talk about, the, I feel like whiteness is under a larger context of coloniality and then even coloniality is under a larger context of this term that I learned recently from my fellow peers and teachers, uh, this idea of onto epistemological privilege, right? Where if you grow up in the West, right? If you like, especially if you're like second or third generation, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter even if you are POC, like you still have privilege, uh, certain type of privilege over indigenous people in the global south who have been indigenous for generations right mm -hmm. and that privilege has to be named and it's been named as onto epistemological privilege meaning they 
there is an the epistemology there this worldview right mm -hmm. of christianity the westernization globalization of like the west as the best is that is the, that privilege that that they are the highest right mm -hmm. that are putting them on the pedestal and so if a poc has taken on certain uh, colonial beliefs then they've not only sided with whiteness but they've also sided with an epistemology that has greater privilege than the indigenous people who have been indigenous for generations on that same line wow and, and so i mean related to this um, right. discussion of these different types of narratives um, mm -hmm. is this conversation about narrative warfare and you were talking about this mm -hmm. um, and how it's about this evolution of uh, racist propaganda and the way mm -hmm. that racial slurs have changed over time from mm -hmm. being very overt and being very public to being more discreet mm -hmm. more embedded within our, 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 our systems and our culture um, mm -hmm. what is narrative warfare and how can people who are impacted by narrative warfare actually fight back yeah, check this out. It's related to the QAnon post you posted recently, right? Hmm. The so-called rebranding. That's not new. It happened, uh, I believe, approximately around uh, around the time Obama got elected. There were actually some uh, white supremacist factions, including, I think, even uh, David Duke's godson, uh, Derek Black, and his faction. Uh, they actually banned the N-word and other racial slurs from all of their forums. Hmm. Isn't that incredible? Like, they banned it, but they were still quite supremacist, right? Mm -hmm. This is why we must not look at overt white supremacy or racism as the only form of racism, because mm -hmm. what happened was the reason why they banned it is precisely because they decided to go covert. They decided to take their fight politically, legally, and socially mm -hmm. with narrative warfare. Like one of the examples of the narrative warfare that they did at the time was the, the narrative that there is a white genocide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which from our perspective is ridiculous, but they actually believe this. That's going back to the reverse victimhood as well, right? The thing about reverse victimhood is that they like, these people sincerely believe in it, which is why it's so hard to talk with them. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in my experience, what those white supremacists did, they literally took that playbook from the liberals. Because liberals had been doing that for generations, for years before white supremacists themselves took it on. Hmm. That's the crazy thing. Remember Martin Luther King's famous quote about the white moderate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That he found them more of a stumbling block than the Ku Klux Klan. I'm totally, uh, I totally believe that. Like, I would rather feel safer talking to the KKK than the California white yoga practitioner. Hmm. Because at least the KKK sincerely and honestly believes in their racism. They don't deny it. They, they are shamelessly into it. Yeah. Whereas with the white yoga practitioner or the white hippie or meditation, you know, that, uh, that archetype, right? Mm -hmm. they have hidden their racism under multiple layers of lies and denial where they sincerely think they're not racist, mm -hmm. which is why there are even articles out there saying it's not enough to be not racist, you have to be anti-racist. That is the reason why those articles came out. Yeah, and, and you know, it's um, interesting because on this discussion of um narrative warfare and you talking about mm -hmm. how this isn't a, a a new move this is something that's been happening for a really long time and it reminds me of even just the way that um you know the proud boys came into existence and how mm -hmm. the proud boys themselves were a rebranding of far-right ideologies that wanted to say hey you know mm -hmm. what we need a magazine friendly clean cut handsome mm -hmm. quote handsome um, <laughs> um brand for ourselves um mm -hmm. and so uh, this goes into the topic of um you know within these dominant narratives uh, another mm -hmm. really important narrative is the discussions revolving around hindu phobia and the mm -hmm. way that 
people antagonize and mistreat Hindus. Um, mm -hmm. As an outsider to this conversation, I know you know very little about this subject, so I'm really curious to know two uh, main things. One, um, who benefits from the continuation of Hindu phobia, and what are the counter narratives that we should be focusing on to uh, battle against this type of home, uh, Hindu phobia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people have also come up with the term dharmaphobia for the reason that uh, Hinduism is a, is a very broad uh, thing or culture known as Sanatana Dharam. And Buddhism and Sikhism and Jainism, they all also technically fall under Hinduism. Mm -hmm. And even under Hinduism proper, there are uh, regional differences in what we believe as well. Mm -hmm. That's uh, important to, to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And as far as like who benefits, uh, one example could be like, remember when you were talking about Chinese medicine practitioners being the traditional ones being arrested, right? Mm -hmm. I feel, I fear that that may eventually happen to yoga and Ayurveda, especially Ayurveda, because that is also related to medicine, right? So it's more likely to happen to Ayurveda than yoga. Mm -hmm. I feel it may happen where there may come a time when the only thing that's con considered legitimate or even legal is somebody who is got certified in a white lead school, whereas the traditional practitioners would be regarded as fraud, right? Mm -hmm. Which is again the the, the reverse, right? Up, things being upside down. And so the narrative that's already happening is that every time uh, we speak up against uh, cultural appropriation of yoga, Ayurveda, and other forms of cultural appropriation we are automatically labeled as fascists, as extremists. Mm -hmm. And who benefits from it is, of course, for some for foremost white people. But also, this is where another term comes in known as white triangulation, right? Mm -hmm. Because there were Indian soldiers who fought for the British Army even back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. There were also, you know, black people who were also slave catchers themselves back in the day, mm -hmm. right? So this is part of a thing called white triangulation. To me, an analogy is like something that blew my mind a few years ago was when I read that it takes only uh, it takes only 12 dogs to shepherd 5,000 sheep, mm -hmm. right? So how did, you know, a small group of people, right, these European colonizers, how did they end up colonizing the whole world? The answer for me is they couldn't have done it without our cooperation, huh. right? Mm -hmm. This is where the white triangulation comes in, the divide and conquer, where they have uh, inserted themselves so much into our uh, our various communities and cultures that even some POC themselves, including South Asians, will be on the side of the people appropriate in yoga and Ayurveda, and they will call us uh, uh, fascist, extremists, hindatva, etc. This is not to say there aren't extremists among Hindus. There may or may not be. Of course there are, right? There are in every community, right? Mm -hmm. But the way they've generalized and blanketed anybody who speaks up, right? against cultural appropriation as fascist is what the narrative is being done. And this also plays into what I said earlier about how, uh, and it's something that I'm very uh, hesitant to bring it up because I don't fully know uh, what's happening in India, but the general impression that I'm getting is that the political left and right do mean different things in different countries. Uh, a more general example would be uh, there are some POC, right, mm -hmm. who grew up in communist dictatorships who are hesitant to uh, identify as leftists. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not going to demonize them for that. I totally understand why they would not identify as leftists, right? Mm -hmm. But what is happening among white liberals and also South Asian leftists is, is something like very similar where my impression is that in India, the political left or the liberals are 
pro-colonial, pro-Westernization, pro-globalization, whereas the political right are actually anti-colonial. But people in the United States don't know this, so they've characterized anybody who is on the right in India as completely evil, extremist, fascist, which, again, is a modern way of saying they are thugs and savages and backward primitives. Hmm, interesting. So, I mean, I actually want to, to talk about this next because, you know, in relation to, um, you know, what you're saying about white triangulation and these different dominant mm-hmm. narratives, um, is this idea of uh, a global misunderstanding of what the political left and right mean and how it is mm-hmm. contextualized. And it's it's different in different cultures mm-hmm. and different countries. Um, and you mentioned mm-hmm. that... Um, you know, because of these different um, distinctions, there's oftentimes a lot of confusion and people weaponize mm-hmm. that confusion. So, like, how exactly. how does this confusion exist? Like, how can we have such a distorted understanding of left and right? And how do white liberals specifically take advantage of this? Yeah, the part of the advantage is, well, part of it is what I said about Anybody, uh, basically anybody who speaks up against cultural appropriation of yoga, Ayurveda, etc., is called, is misconstrued as somebody on the political right of India, right? Mm-hmm. And all fascist extremists. And the funny thing is, like, I've never even been to India. I am Southeast Asian. I'm Burmese. I happen to be Indian, Punjabi Hindu, who grew up in Burma in Southeast Asia, right? Mm -hmm. So, in fact, I don't identify, even though I'm very political, I don't identify with any political label precisely because I see all of these different sides as very problematic in different ways, you know, Mm -hmm. where, at least in the United States, the the conservatives are the the openly overt racist people, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas the liberals and the leftists are more of the the covert racism, right? And and so even what I said earlier could be misconstrued, right? As oh, condemn is on the side of the KKK, right? Mm-hmm. If you took it out of context, right? Mm-hmm. People could easily like take a snippet out of this audio recording, and be like. Oh, condensed science with the KKK, right? <laughs> that is an example of how they take advantage, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, it's interesting that you bring that up because I know that um, a lot of people uh, do have that gut reaction to you know mm-hmm. mislabel you if you do talk about um, different social issues, whether it's colonization, mm-hmm. whether it is cultural appropriation, um, where you do get warped, and oftentimes I think mm-hmm. a lot of activists who uh, want to speak up, see this mistreatment of people who are vocal about oppressive systems, and that can sort of um, discourage them from wanting to talk. And so uh, I guess my last question is, uh, if you were to advise people who who see these issues, who, who understand them at the level that you do and are curious about them, um, but they are, aren't sure how to speak up, how to uh, make their voice heard, like what kind of advice would you give uh, two different artists and creatives of color who want to, um, you know, strengthen their voice and, and, and be more vocal? Yeah, I advise uh, two things. One is reading up on logical fallacies such as uh, false equivalence, right, reverse victimhood. Well, technically it's not a logical fallacy, but it's still a psychological weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ad hominems, right? Uh, false binaries, such as the good evil false binary, where you know either you're this perfect person who has to be put on a pedestal, or you're totally evil. When in reality, most people are somewhere in between, right? Mm-hmm. False binaries are, uh, and also cognitive biases, especially cognitive dissonance. Uh, I recommend a resource called theoatmeal.com/belief. It's a little comic. It's a great education on cognitive dissonance. And, and then the other side is, and also educate yourself on reverse victimhood, really study that and that. The other thing is to study the, the history of the linkage of ideas, right? Mm-hmm. So part of toxic positivity in their colonial spirituality is 
a major part is something called uh, the law of attraction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So study its history. Where does it come from, right? It it comes from the prosperity gospel, right? Where does the prosperity gospel come from? It comes from manifest destiny. Wow. And what is manifest destiny? It was very genocidal, right? As you probably know. Mm -hmm. So study that history of linkage of ideas. And and that's why at the very top, you start seeing, you know, people who seem to be uh, Democrats, right, say really weird things, such as Nancy Pelosi saying that uh, George Floyd was a martyr when he wasn't. He, he was actually begging for his life, right? Mm -hmm. Or even the recent thing she said about, uh, she literally said something that sounded very conservative to me about student loans, right? Mm -hmm. When she said, oh, you know, we shouldn't cancel student loans because, you know, I'm just paraphrasing, right? We shouldn't cancel student loans because you're like, what if, you know, you're, you don't have a child or your child decides not to go to college? Do you want to, you know, pay for somebody else's education or you know student loan cancel i'm like that is so weird coming out of her mouth that's something a conservative would say mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so yeah so at the top there, there's like a mixing emerging to be aware of those patterns as well so study history study logical fallacies cognitive biases and and really notice how at the top they're both the same wow well Kundan, it's been awesome having you on the show, and I actually, you know, in the, in the short time that we've uh, had you on, uh, I've learned so much. Um, I'd love to go ahead and invite you back some time, uh, but before we head mm -hmm. out, uh, what are you working on these days, and where can our audience uh, find you and support you? Um, I am working on possibly uh, a book for creatives and an app so that we can do the opposite of what Westerners recommend to have a discipline of rest uh, rather than hard work. Uh, and so I have that in the works. I also have a Patreon. I relaunched it a few weeks ago where beyond likes and followers, uh, you can support me by joining my Patreon. And there are different levels and different rewards. Although at the lowest level, there is no reward uh, because it's to help sustain what I already provide for free on the internet on various social social media platforms. I'm most active on Instagram right now, although I also have Facebook and YouTube. Uh, everywhere I'm Kundan Chabra, but on Instagram, I'm Akashi Consultant Chabra. Awesome. Well, we'll definitely go ahead. And, and of course, my, oh, sorry, my Patreon is patreon.com slash Breakthrough Awakening. Awesome. Well, we'll go ahead and link to your Patreon, to your Instagram, and to all your socials. Um, and again, Kundan, it was great having you on. We'll have you back some time. Um, have a great day. Take care. You too. Have a great day.